<coughs> Welcome to CS4510. This is lecture L5A. The topic of today is syntactic structures. Syntactic structures, so there's only a few important ideas in this course. There's only a few reasons you take this course. Everything else is uh, just padding and notation until you can get to those ideas. Last time we talked about context-free grammars. We talked a little bit about algebraic closure properties. The point of a context-free grammar is in, was, in fact, that it was developed for the topic we get today. So we talked about context-free grammar, so we can talk about what we're talking about today. Syntactic structure, there's only, there's only like five and a half, six really important ideas in this course. Non-determinism, syntactic structures, the church Turing thesis, um, uh, incompleteness and undecidability, and then finally we'll have um, uh, algorithmic, ra algorithmic randomness, and we'll do uh, the relativization barrier. So this is the second important idea in the course. Everything else, again, is leading up to just those six lectures. Syntactic structures is a monograph by Noam Chomsky, written in 19-something, 54, 60, something like this. It looks like this. I'm going to hold it up on camera. It's just 90 pages, but it's a, uh, a groundbreaking work in theoretical linguistics. And it's probably one of the most important historical documents of all time. It's aged, certainly, but it is the fact that it was written at all rather than what it's consisting of is what's ma what makes it important. Um, so first off, what is language? What is uh, um, this whole thing about? So language is a, an agreement we all have where we, s we uh, use our throat and we move it in certain ways and we make utterances at each other. Uh, so like uh, there's me. And then I'm going to a few. And let's say I'm thinking of a horse. Okay, I'm thinking of a horse. And I'm trying to talk to you about a horse, so I'll say, I'll say the word horse to you. Um, and uh, language is um, it's more than communication, in fact. It's sort of the, uh, a casting of all ideas. So you have an idea. It's internal. It's somehow in your brain. You want to express and communicate that idea. You don't have a choice. You have no choice but to use language. Or f the decisions you've made, uh, uh, unfortunately, you, the only way to express an idea is uh, literally using words. And that sounds obvious, but then the, we take the contrapositive of that statement, perhaps. The limitations of language itself perhaps can limit the kinds of ideas that can be expressed. So language is really important to the study of ideas themselves, and rather than just the study of language by itself. This is sort of an older school philosophy, but this is the importance of language. Um, you want to communicate an idea, you have to use words. You can't simply share the encoding of your neurons uh, which one's positive, which one's negative, to try and communicate the, the mental image there. And by necessity, language is, is inherently a lossy channel, right? I utter the word horse. The, co the utterance horse, the sound I make with my horse voice, is vastly less complicated than the idea of a horse itself. Horse, quadruped, eats grass. Maybe it's brown. Maybe you see the movie Spirit. The utterance horse is just like, takes less than a second to say. And it... Necessarily, if I say the word horse to you, each of you are picturing a different horse. I don't know what that horse is, but it's, uh, it's definitely different than the horse that I'm thinking of. Right? Um, so language is, is uh, important in some sense because the only way to study ideas is through uh, the study of language. Sometimes linguists think of themselves really as just developing a theory of the mind. If you have a function and you can only, I mean, you're looking at its outputs, that's the only way you can determine whatever the input could have been. So, some, in some sense, uh, it is this, it is an attempt. The study of linguistics is an attempt to study uh, the theory of the mind. Uh, two, it's really important for us as human beings uh, for several reasons. One, uh, there's another book by Chomsky called "Why Only Us," and it asks. Why are we the only species that has developed complicated uh, ways of communication? You know, dogs uh, can wag their tails at each other. They bark. They can play. They can do really trivial things. 
Monkeys can also do really trivial things. Uh, they can't really do anything as complicated as expressing ideas that, as, as we can. You know, they tried to teach a monkey how to do language, and the only uh, the longest sentence ever recorded, the monkey was called Nim Chimsky, after Noam Chomsky. They tried to teach the, this chimpanzee uh, language, and the, and the longest sentence it said, do you guys know the sentence? Uh, give me orange, me eat orange, give me orange, give me eat. Me eat orange, give me you. Something like this, right? So it, it, it was unable to develop any of the grammatical structure that, um, I think it was 19 words long. It was simply, it made the association between the, the utterance and the Pavlovian reward of getting an orange. But it wasn't able to perform uh, or arrange the words in the sentence in any way that we would consider grammatical. So another thing that's unique to humans is not simply communication, but the distinguishing between a sentence being grammatical and a sentence being ungrammatical. So it's something that humans do uniquely, certainly. The second thing is it's really important to us as, so we're the only species that does this, and it's also, in some sense, the reason that we are human and not animals, because, you know, let's say, uh, like, fire hot. How do you teach an animal fire hot? It, unfortunately, has to learn through experience. It touches the fire. Oh my God, it's hot. It'll never do that again, right? And uh, the way that information is passed down through animals takes generations and generations of um, being denied or giving them certain stimulus. You know, you can. Uh, why are dogs afraid of uh, snakes or why are cats afraid of dogs? Or why is every animal afraid of humans? Every animal is afraid of humans because for the past 150,000 years, we, every time we saw a buffalo, we chased it for eight hours a day until it got exhausted. So 150,000 years of generations of buffalo are terrified of us, uh, even though we may not be that big and imposing. That's, most animals are scared of us because we, as humans, have ran down every animal species, you know, except the few that we've conditioned, like dogs and cats, to, to train with us. Now, in order for a piece of information to be encoded evolutionarily in an animal, unfortunately, it requires a lot of death. A species has to die out several times for, for the strain of that species to have that uh, feature to become the dominant one. Now, great thing about humans is we don't have to encode uh, information into our descendants using several generations of genocide. We can simply tell our children fire hot, and they understand, hopefully, without having to have uh, you know, half of the humans die off to experience that fire is hot. We get to encode dangers into society. Information can be passed down generationally without the evolutionary mechanism. It can be done through simply communication. And this is what is literally civilization. I mean, like, um, agriculture is when we, started pick we stopped picking berries and we started growing grass. And then you can grind that grass into flour, and then you could bake that flour, and then you have a sandwich. So if we didn't, weren't able to communicate, there was, you know, in every village or whatever, there was a professional sandwich maker. How do you communicate, that guy is mortal, he's going to die. How do, you, how do you ensure the next village, the next generation of humans in the village have a sandwich maker? The sandwich maker trains the next sandwich maker, and so on, right? It's not that the guy, the next sandwich maker doesn't, is not tasked with reinventing the wheel. He gets to stand on the so shoulders of giants, right? It's, it's definitely the only reason that we exist, and... Uh, civilization, civilization is cool and all those things. Um, now, what it, syntactic structures is, uh, as a monograph, so these are the important reasons why language is cool. As a monograph, syntactic structure is, the, is, is an attempt, maybe perhaps not successful, but it is first, a first attempt to undertake a rigorous and scientific understanding of what language is and what do words mean and why are things associated with the way they were. So, a no, we can notice immediately some parts of, uh, of, of the structure of language. We have two, thi two features. We have syntax and we have semantics. So syntax is the representation of objects. It, a sentence can be encoded in some way. It has a description. It is literally a, a sequence of letters and symbols and periods and spaces and so on. And you can think of a sentence as simply a chain of words. But semantic is uh, a property of the sentence that is not about its description, but about its meaning. So perhaps it could be if the sentence is true, if there's an implication in the sentence, if there's an intonation, that, 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 uh, a meaning that is communicated with the sentence. And uh, we'll talk more in detail about these two properties and, and, and how they, uh, 
at what the interplay is with, with each other. So the important part about um, syntactic structures is not necessarily that it's correct and it's good and it's smart or any of those things, but it's the fact that Chomsky was the first person to come in to someone else's house with more math than them. For a very long time, uh, linguistics was like many other fields of non-science in the sense that it was very empirical. And you would go in there and you would like go in, it was a lot of field work. You would go into the wild and you would record utterances and you would record accents and you would try and make hypotheses about where these accents came from, where did this language come from, and so on. But um, in this monograph, Syntactic Structures, he tries to do the opposite. He tries to sort of come back from a high level, level explanation and try and see if he can explain why certain things are the way that they are. For example, like uh, let's say you see one ball bounce, and then as a physicist, you derive an equation of motion that explains why the ball bounces. You could do that, or you could just try to create a general theory of gravity and then cast the ball bouncing as a special case, something like this. And he, he was the first person, in, perhaps in history, to come, back, come at it from the opposite angle. Um, before we get into some of the details in the monograph, we can also talk about what's called the universal grammar. This is Chomsky's specific theory of uh, grammar, like what is it as a feature of humanity. Um, so first off, language is not innate. We as humans are not born speaking any specific language. The baby says goo goo gaga and so on. So the baby obviously is not born speaking the language. Um, no baby is, is born speaking any language. So first off, it's not innate. Speaking a language is not innate. Um, <coughs> There were some experiments in the Middle Ages where they, they like, uh, airdropped a baby onto an island and they tried to get the baby to see if, if it had no stimulus, if we don't talk to the baby, what language will it speak? And I, maybe this was in Poland or something in the Middle Ages. But they tried to figure out, okay, the king had this theory like, okay, if the baby doesn't know, if, if no one tell, talks to the baby, the baby will, will speak its innate language and that'll be the language of the gods, something like this. And what ended up happening is that the children that were not spoken to until they were like eight or nine years old had severe mental cognitive disabilities. I mean, it was basically child abuse. That's why they tell you when you have a baby, you got to talk to the baby, even if the baby can't talk back. You know, um, so language is not innate. We don't know how to. We're not born speaking a language. Yet, language, the ability to learn a language, is innate. So the language itself, speaking a language, is not innate. But the baby, the ability to learn a language, is innate. So how do you learn a language as a child? If you're an adult, it's much harder. Uh, babies have the, you know, the neuroplasticity to absorb any and all things uh, they say. Part of the reason why I think uh, Minecraft YouTubers are very dangerous is a generation of children are going to, you know, it's, it's, it, the, they're getting rewired um, on these things. Uh, the baby simply, you know, you speak to the baby. It doesn't, the baby doesn't go to English class, okay? The baby doesn't know what a noun and a gerund and a verb is. You just speak at the baby. The, through f the baby in its lifetime has heard only finitely many utterances. It's heard some example sentences. And it will develop the cadence and the accent and the, the method of speaking of its inputs. So through somehow through only finitely many sensory observations, it will develop the ability to speak correct language, whatever that language is. In this lecture specifically, we'll focus on English. The features of English are not particularly important or successful or amazing or anything, but it's the language that we should all be speaking. And uh, we'll just use it as, as an example of anything, right? You don't, a baby doesn't, in, in general, you don't utter a correct sentence because you know what a noun is and a verb is and a gerund is and an adjective and all these things. You don't have a set of laws that you have memorized and then deduce the correct grammatical and correct sentences according to those laws. Instead, somehow innately, you just have the ability to on the fly generate sentences. And one of the most important things about language is the fact that you have the ability of, you have two things, analysis and synthesis. of new language, I, all the time, am, am uttering new sentences that you've never heard before. It's the point of learning. Somehow you have the ability to correctly parse and deduce the semantic meaning of a sentence that you've never heard before. You know what the, you know an idea is being communicated to you, you know what the idea is, even though you've never heard an example of that specific sentence, even the sentences that I'm saying now. You have the ability as well to formulate a thought in your head and communicate that thought, hopefully clearly to someone, 
even though that is not a sentence that you may have ever uttered before, and it's not a sentence that someone else has ever heard before. Now, that sounds kind of obvious because we use language in this way all the time, you know? But when you say it out loud like that, it kind of sounds, uh, it makes it sound special. So the ability of our brains to parse both produce language and, uh, so like, synthesize language and, an, and perform analysis of language is certainly unique. It makes us very different than computers in many, in many ways. The universal grammar is the idea that even if language is not uh, innate, the structures that are shared by many languages are defined using by the wires and pipes that are in our head. Uh, just neurologically, things are set up in certain ways, and those are reflected in the universal features that many languages share. Have you noticed that every language uh, uses a space to denote, to delimit either words or sentences? Uh, every language is written in a linear fashion. I don't think there's a language that's written in a tree-like structure. That's the reason we study formal languages as sets of strings and not sets of graphs or something weird. Uh, there are many such features. You know, <coughs> nouns uh, are mostly interchangeable, things like this. Plural, specific, gendered language. Some languages don't have everything, of course, you know. But uh, many features, such features are shared. All right. Any questions so far? Okay. Let's talk about, I'm just going to go chapter by chapter and over explain uh, what they are. Um, chapter one is the introduction. It's like a page long, but I'm going to talk more about than that. Introduction. So what is the point of like uh, a syntactic structure or, or anything like this? And first off, unlike something like chemistry or physics, um, the study of language cannot be made absolute, uh, but we should try really hard to, to still make it absolute. Have I told the story in this class yet about the, um, the parable of Diogenes and Plato? Okay, you guys know who Diogenes and Plato are? Di Diogenes, um, he's like, a, he's like a philosopher that everybody hated, right? He was like a hobo kind of guy? Yeah, he was a serial public masturbator. This yeah. guy lived in a jar out in the outskirts of the city. Um, there is no place to spit in a rich man's house if not his face. Uh, Plato, uh, Platonic solids, Platonic schools of thought, Platonistic reality, uh, Neoplatonism. Unfortunately, it's nothing to do with Plato, but Platonism. Um, what else? Uh, Plato, uh, Plato's theory of forms. You know, this guy had every idea. Plato was obsessed with trying to make a dichotomy of all objects and a hierarchy of all objects. Those that are real, those that are not. Be you know, he derived, for example, uh, there is the form of beauty, and from beauty you may derive objects that are beautiful, and from objects that are beautiful you may derive objects that imitate beauty, and so on. So, so you can place everything real, or immaterial, or material on some sort of giant a uh, binary tree in some way, and then you can organize thoughts according to how pure they are, how applied they are. Um, Diogenes was not interested in any of that. Uh, and famously, Plato, he, had, he was a very recognized scholar. He had a school in, uh, you know, people would come and sit in the amphitheater. They would listen to this man talk. Um, he uh, made an assertion one day. Uh, man is that which is a featherless biped. Um, so but essentially what Plato is doing here is he's trying to create a description of man. And by man here, we mean humanity. So what Plato is essentially asserting is that for all objects, n, that that is man. A man is that which is f a featherless is that exactly and only that which is a featherless biped, right? So consider all the objects an ancient Greek man had at uh, his accession. You have sheep, you have rocks, maybe a mountain, clouds, uh, music, um, um, that's basically it, I guess. So uh, you take all objects, everything either is or isn't feathered. You agree? Chickens are feathered. Um, Goats are not feathered, and so on, right? So nothing can both be feathered and featherless. Take everything that is or isn't a biped. Everything that is or isn't a biped. You have goats are not bipeds. Humans are bipeds. Um, rocks are probably not bipeds. So you take all objects. You take the dichotomy of all objects. And then you simply, he asserts that 
the objects that are categorized as man are that which is a, that are featherless and a biped. Uh, Diogenes famously uh, crashes the party and he holds up a plucked chicken. Uh, he raises a plucked chicken and he says, Behold, a man. Now, uh, what Diogenes has really done here is provide a counterexample to uh, uh, Plato's definition. Uh, is a plucked chicken a man? No. Is a plucked chicken featherless? Yeah. Is a plucked chicken a biped? Yeah. So he basically found a counterexample to Plato's definition of what is uh, a man. Now here's the sort of the moral reason we're talking about this. Uh, featherless and feathered and bipeds are properties of objects that can be determined uh, purely, almost syntactically. You look at the object and it's unambiguous what is or isn't feathered and what is or isn't a biped. Now, what is a definition of a man in like the context of humanity? What is makes humans exceptional? What makes us not animals? Uh, un uh, unfortunately, Plato tried to assert that that, that which is special, that which is a human, is exactly that which is not feathered in a biped. But according to Diogenes, a chicken, a plucked chicken, in fact, is exactly, would, under Plato's definition, would be a man. The problem is, is that man is not exactly something that can be easily characterized by simple checks outside of the system. So, like, if you were to draw a picture of it, here's Plato. And then you have, inside, inside him, he has some definition of man. But, unfortunately, you can't project and describe this definition of man in terms of language outside of the system. It's one of these things that can be decided upon, but cannot be explained upon what, why it is decided upon. We know exactly what is or isn't human. If I give you an object, all of you have the ability to distinguish that from which is human from that which is not. But you have no way to explain to someone else how would you, why something is or isn't a human. That's sort of the moral here. Uh, and unfortunately, we're left with sort of a circular definition about what is a man. Uh, to Plato, a man is that which Plato says is a man. So unfortunately, there's nothing that can be described by, as a man by Plato except that which Plato says is. Uh, the point, to bring this back towards the, the, the point of language, the study of language is, in some sense, to distinguish the grammatical uh, from the ungrammatical. So we want to tell apart the, the grammatical from the ungrammatical. So I give you a sentence, I give you an utterance, independent of the meaning of the sentence, if it has any sense or not, you can tell me that's grammatically correct sentence. That's an ungrammatically correct sentence, right? But there's no real way for you to do this in an explanatory fashion besides just saying, yeah, that's probably, I mean, that just sounds grammatical to me, you know? Um, you, there's... You could, you could try to appeal to the dictionary or something and say, well, obviously look at the rules of English. This, doesn't f this can't be parsed in a certain way. But that's not how language works in practice. Uh, language is an agreement we all have, and if we all say something is grammatical, then it is, independent of whatever rulemaking body says it is or isn't. So grammatical is, a pro the property of a sentence being grammatical is exactly like Plato's definition of a man, which is that it's impossible necessarily to categorize and make easily and checkable. You can't simply say, oh, it's obviously grammatical because all of these syntactic properties are met. You can't say it's ungrammatical because none of these syntactic properties are met. That's impossible to be done. Uh, and unfortunately, is distinguishing the, the study of linguistics from something like chemistry or physics. Because you can do these kinds of things for chemistry or physics, right? Questions so far? All right. Um, Chapter 2 is on the independence of grammar. Consider the following two sentences. Colorless uh, green ideas 
sleep furiously. And co consider the second sentence, furiously sleep ideas green colorless. So there was an ancient idea, and Chomsky sort of disproves this, uh, of an equivalence between syntax and semantic. And again, semantic is a property of meaning. It's a, given an object, a semantic property is one about its meaning, about its uh, uh, about an interpretation of the object. A syntactic property is one about the description of the object. How many letters does it have? How many, what's the length of it ha that it has? A semantic property may be like, is the sentence true or false? Uh, logically, logical truth is certainly a semantic property of a sentence. Syntax may be you know, something about the object itself, the description of the object. Um, uh, the first sentence, is it grammatical or ungrammatical? Grammatical. Why? Feels right. Yeah, that's, and that's all you need. Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. That is a grammatically correct sentence. Why? Sounds grammatical. The intonation makes it easier to memorize. Uh, OK, so it's, it's grammatically correct. So grammatical is a syntactic property. It's grammatically correct. So we'll call, this, we'll call this one, and we'll call this two. One is grammatical. Now, what is the meaning? Is there a meaning of sentence one? Not really. I mean, uh, it, it, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Ideas are not capable of sleep. You cannot be both colorless and green. So uh, one is, uh, uh, we'd also say, devoid of meaning. So immediately he, and we'll come back to this question later on in, in more depth, he immediately shows a counterexample between that which is semantic and that which is syntactic. So you cannot immediately study an equivalence of a semantic property of a sentence by studying the grammatical correctness of a sentence. There was an old school field of thought. Remember, we talked about how all ideas have to be represented somehow using language. And the only way to study ideas is to study language. You cannot study the meaning of sentences by studying the grammatical correctness of the sentences. You cannot necessarily study the ideas by studying the representation of the ideas. There certainly is a distinguishing factor between those. And he uses this example of a sentence which is grammatically correct yet devoid of meaning. So a sentence being meaningful has nothing to do with the fact that it is grammatical. Those are two totally independent properties. Now, necessarily, all the cool ideas definitely have uh, are grammatically correct. But it's not necessarily an if and only if. Right? In fact, you can come up with sentences that are semantic, that have meaning, yet are not syntactic. Can we come up with a sentence which is semantically correct, as in it communicates idea, as in, like, I make the utterance, you have digested and understood the exact idea which I wish, that I wish to communicate, but the sentence itself is not grammatical? Anything Yoda ever said? Yoda? That would work. Let's suppose, according to Yoda, though, it's grammatical. It's a grammaticalness. Let's say that's a correct example, but I want to find another. Give me a Yoda sentence. Run, I have. Run, I have. What does that mean? That in the past, you ran. Run, I. OK. Let's suppose that that would be considered grammatically correct relative to the species that is Yoda and baby Yoda. Give me another ungrammatical sentence, which is meaningful. We may take that as an accent, and therefore grammatical. It's subjective. Again, we're not doing good science here. But do we have another example of a grammatically correct, uh, excuse me, an ungrammatical sentence which has meaning? Uh, E.T. phone call. That's also another alien. That's a yeah. cheap one. Let's do another one. You can't just come up with another alien species. What? Kids said it too. Yes, so it's grammatical. If they agree on the sentence, <coughs> it's, it's correct. This is a, this is a tricky one. Let's, let's just see one, if someone has one more suggestion. Again, has meaning does not have structural grammar relative to anyone. 
alien species or otherwise? Subjective question, it needs a subjective answer. Does anyone have any guess? Cry. Crying, yeah, wailing, a baby crying. That's a good one. Uh, I was thinking of yelling. Any, if you yell a noun really loudly, it's as if you're scared of that object, like shark. That's, there, that's a noun that contains no other verb, article, any sort of association, so. Uh, right, that's not even a word but yet the meaning has been conveyed of uh, impertinent danger. So certainly the, the, you cannot study syntax and semantics. You cannot study the semantic value of a sentence by studying syntax. So the study, of semantic, the study of syntax itself, of grammatical from the ungrammatical, as scientists we're trying to distinguish grammatical from the ungrammatical. How is something, tell these two things apart, and it will have no association of the meaning of a sentence. So we suddenly, these are two separate studies. This is the first remark he makes on this. Right. In fact, the sentence, colorless green idea sleep furiously, is such a famous example that it now has meaning because it means it's in reference to syntactic structures by Noam Chomsky. There's a writing contest every year to figure out how can someone use this sentence correctly. Uh, so unfortunately, that sentence now has meaning. Uh, consider the first sentence being grammatical and the second sentence, is the second sentence grammatical? Why? It's not grammatical, but why? It doesn't sound grammatical. Furious sleep ideas, green colorless. It doesn't have the intonation or the cadence of the sentence. It doesn't sound like someone is talking to you. You know, um, It just sounds wrong. So the same reason we may say the first one is grammatical, we may distinguish the second one as ungrammatical. So one, so this is the first idea, is uh, separation of syntax from semantics. Second is one is grammatical. Uh, two is ungrammatical, okay? But uh, what is the probability each of those sentences has been spoken in English? Perhaps it's negligible. One and two have both been, spe both been spoken in English, like in the history of anyone ever saying sentences, a uh, negligible amount, negligible amount. It's basically zero, but we can't say for certain it's zero, that the probability of those sentences has been spoken. So they have, perhaps, you would estimate that sentences one and sentence two have the same probability of being spoken, ever, in the history of English. Um, but one is grammatical and two is not. So what we may assert then is that grammatical in English is uh, independent of statistical approximation to English. Statistical approximation to English. The likelihood that a sentence will be uttered or has ever been uttered has nothing to do with if the sentence is grammatical or ungrammatical. So Chomsky goes on here to argue that the object of decision that separates the sentences which are grammatical from the sentences which are grammatical is not randomized. It is not a process which is probabilistic. Now, uh, this is sort of uh, the part of syntax structures that has not aged that well. He argues that any, and again, you take it as we develop, if you develop a scientific theory of language this way, Perhaps you can extend it and write computer programs that can separate grammatical from ungrammatical, for most cases at least, perhaps in an approximate scenario. Such an algorithm, we could, if this were true, we could extend this idea and say such an algorithm could not be a randomized algorithm. Any such algorithm must be uh, deterministic in some sense. But this has not really aged well. Why? He provides a counterexample here of two sentences that have negligible probability of ever being uttered, yet one is grammatical and one is ungrammatical. And he says this is a counterexample to an algorithm that determines grammaticalness from ungrammaticalness being a randomized algorithm, or one that takes in, perhaps, the probabilities of this of the approximation in English. Why is this not a counterexample anymore today? Because of generative AI. Doing yeah, that. languages, so like everyone agrees ChatGPT is wrong. Well, I don't know about that, but most people agree it's wrong on things. 
but no one disagrees that it speaks incorrect English. The ability of the, 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 these models uh, are fully probabilistic, but but uh, they don't have. Uh, they certainly output correct language. I mean, no one has ever argued that ChatGPT made a typo. In fact, it makes its lack of typos is, is disturbing. You can even say, you know, but respond like a cowboy, and it'll it'll do the accents and everything for you. It's too good at this. So this is uh, like a, a with the AI people. This is an argument that he, that they take big um, opposition to, and it's not one that's aged well. Uh, and there are many historic, even from like 2011, about the success of probabilistic models in this thing. The thing is, though, is that this argument is from like 1954, uh, 54, 57, something like this. It's ancient. I mean, this is before. This is an argument. He's talking about um, uh, not really the modern definition of what we have as a randomized algorithm. He's really talking about two things. One is something like a function of like a pro that would exert a chance or a probability of grammatical or not, a sentence being grammatical or not, that takes us in a function of a probability of something being, uh, a, it's a statistical approximation to English. Like the probability, like somehow it's a function of the probability, like x squared plus two or something, you know. Um, the second model he's arguing against is something, it's called a, a, a finite state Markov process, which you can think of like a DFA with some probabilities on its, on its edges, you know? Something like this, whatever. You know, and this is sort of the ancient idea of what he was arguing about a, as a randomized algorithm. And this is kind of obvious when you read the fact that he's citing Shannon's uh, paper throughout the thing. Quicksort would not have been invented for another two years. Uh, the Rabin Miller primality test would not have been invented for like 10 years, and then the modern definition of randomized algorithms would not have been invented for like 35 years. So it's an argument that has not aged well, but I don't think it's really his fault. But just know that when you're working in a field that's not as exact as, as physics or math or chemistry, that things go, can go wrong like this, right? We're creating uh, exemplary sentences and we're trying to cast them in a certain way. Any questions on chapter two? Great. Chapter three, uh, an elementary linguistic theory. So what he notices first is that certain finite subsets of English appear regular. So English has some regular substructure. Uh, well, this is a, a DFA. It paths to the accept state of this DFA enumerate two sentences of English. The old man comes, the old men come. Different paths perhaps can explain uh, differences in singular versus plural. Um, oh, I did this wrong. The man comes, the, the men come. Now, this enumerates in some sense the finite, a finite subset of English. But using this, you can actually enumerate an infinite subset of English. Uh, the man comes, the men come, the old man comes, the old, old man comes, the old, 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 old man comes, the old, 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 old man comes. So this enumerates a, a fraction of English, which looks like a fragment of English, the old star m men come. Or uh, man comes. Something like this, right? Perhaps you could, that's how you would regularize, re make a regular expression of that DFA. So some parts of English appear to be have a regular structure and appear to be enumerated by a DFA. Now, uh, first question is, is it grammatically correct to insert 
the word old 10 million times. Yeah. Okay, good enough. So, yeah. Um, and, but if you observe this, like, okay, maybe English can be regularized in some sense, it turns out that you'll, you'll reach a lot of difficulty trying to explain some of the more complicated sentences. But you don't have to, uh, the next point he makes, uh, English has non-regular substructure. Now, having a non-regular substructure does not necessarily imply that the whole language is not regular. Now, the same way, well, actually, excuse me, having a non-regular substructure is, this is sort of a conditional theorem. It, a set having a non-regular subset does not imply that the set is regular, right? Every set is a subset of sigma star, but sigma star is regular. But all the non-regular subsets are also subsets of sigma star. So in some sense, you have to be able to convince yourself exactly why this applies to English being regular. If we can enumerate an infinite subset of English, uh, it's, it implies still that English itself is not regular. Now recall the three canonical non-regular languages. We have a to the n, b to the n, n is a number. We have... Uh, w, W, R, W is in sigma star, and we have um, W, W, uh, W is in sigma star, right? And uh, by analogy, we can sort of create a fragment of English that appears to be like one of these non-regular languages. Uh, let S1, S2 uh, be the declarative English sentences, be declarative sentences in English. Consider the declarative sentence S to be uh, if SI, uh, then uh, SJ, where SI and SJ are any two declarative sentences in English. Now, set SI equals S several times, N times. What kind of sentence are we going to get? We're going to get uh, if, if, let's just do it once, if if SI, then SJ, then SJ, right? What happens if we set it n times? We're going to get uh, if to the n SI, then SJ to the n. Uh, yeah. What do we notice about that? That's kind of like a to the n, b to the n, right? Now, notice that this, this, he, this is a non-regular substructure of English, uh, but convince yourself that there is not a regular, even this, there is not a regular explanation that would satisfy perhaps a superset of this language to be regular. Consider... Uh, that the fact that the number of ifs have to exactly match the number of thens. Those two uh, groups have to be uh, together. It's true, necessarily, that a to the n, b to the n, that language is a subset, a strict subset, in fact, of a star, b star. And a star, b star can be decided using a regular expression, right? Just make sure the a's come before the b's. a to the n, b to the n is, in is inherently slightly more computationally difficult to decide because... You need to make sure not only do the A's come before the B's, but the A's equal the number of B's. And that is harder to decide than just making sure the A's come before the B's. So this is a strict subset. A non-regular language is a strict subset of a regular language. But convince yourself that this is a fragment of English that cannot be explained in another regular way, right? If you have an, the, in, uh, some number of ifs that does not match some number of thens, then the whole sentence is wrong. So that is not explainable, right? Would you, this is a theorem that can apply sort of, unfortunately we're not doing science here, you just kind of have to wave your hands, but this is enough to explain that English is not regular. So here we can conclude, therefore, that English is not regular.
any grammatically producing device that either produces correct English sentences or has the ability to distinguish the grammatical from the ungrammatical in English cannot be one of the regular devices we use. Can't be a DFA, NFA, regular expression, uh, regular grammar, uh, GNFA, or anything like that. Right? Questions on this part, English being not regular? There's a final corollary we can take of this uh, theorem, and it's the fact that even if English, so if English is not regular, but you and I have the ability to distinguish the grammatical from the ungrammatical, somehow the wires and pipes in our brain cannot look like a DFA. Would you agree? Somehow the neurons whatever way they're connected, whatever way they're organized, uh, they can't look too much like a DFA, right? At least whatever you can say with language acquisition. Language, you have the ability of decision making, grammatical from ungrammatical. Whatever physiologically that looks like, it doesn't look like a DFA, right? Here's a substructure of English then that that piece of your brain would fail on, fail to understand. Questions on this? All right, the next chapter is on phrase structure. Basically, all this chapter is, he's like, okay, well, DFAs aren't, aren't that interesting. Guess what is interesting? Context-free grammars. He defines the following context-free grammar to enumerate some structure of English. Sentence goes to noun phrase, verb phrase. Here, plus is not a special symbol. It's Think of it as a concatenation. VP and NP are non-terminals to denote that NP will generate a noun phrase and VP will generate a verb phrase. So we could do something like noun phrase is an article and a noun. Uh, and then a verb phrase is a verb plus a noun phrase. And then an article could be like, what are some articles? Anyone know English better than me? Anyone know what an article is? A, uh, yeah, those are the only two articles I know. Those are articles in English. Um, noun, N is a non-terminal to generate nouns. Man, men, ball, etc. A uh, verb generates, let's say, hit, took, etc. Um, and we can actually generate some f parts of English, interestingly, with this way more than we could with the DFA. So what I'll do is describe what's called a parse tree. And a parse tree is a way to explain how a CFG uh, produces a certain sentence. So a sentence produces a noun phrase and a verb phrase. And then a noun phrase can produce an article and a noun. And that the verb phrase then produces a verb and a noun phrase. And let's say this produces the... This produces man. Let's say this produces hit. And let's say noun phrase produces an article and a noun. And let's say this is the ball. This produces the sentence, the man hit the ball. So this is what's called a parse tree. A parse tree is a tree organization. You take the leaves, the concatenation of the leaves is the sentence that's produced. Um, this appears to produce quite a lot of English, maybe most of it, maybe all of it. Um, so basically, all you does is remark that a sentence is grammatical. Now, if internally we have some sort of gram grammatical structure with the wires that turn the organization in, notice, though, that when we read language, we take on input into the language, uh, time moves forward. And I'm communicating to you a string. When I say the man hit the ball, I say it in this order. I say the man hit the ball. 
somehow you parse the sentence of the meaning and perhaps you, in an invisible mental model, parse the, 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 the linearly ordered string of words into uh, separate phrases like this and then organize those somehow by idea. So the way I utter the sentence to you is understood a certain way, is understood in a different way than the way the sentence is spoken. So perhaps this is a way to explain amb ambiguity in language because perhaps two people hear the same sentence and they parse it in different ways. You know, a sentence, a sentence can be ambiguous. Um, you know, uh, I can't think of one right now, but you can probably think of a sentence that it's not, you're not sure who did what. Uh, uh, it's not, it's not well, well explained. Like, a, like, you probably read headlines and that you're like, well, I don't I know what he's talking about. I don't, you know. um, right. So this, this can explain uh, s some parts of English. And necessarily, the tree structure communicates more than the sentence itself does. Unfortunately, though, when we communicate, we're forced to use sentences because time moves one way. Now, if you were to write down paragraphs in tree... Uh, in terms of trees, instead of lines, things would be communicated more effectively, but that would be kind of annoying. Right? Questions on that? So this is called a phrase structure. And for us now, at least, a phrase structure is that which is the CFG. It's just exactly and only a CFG. But notice that the CFG has also the ability to generate ungrammatical sentences. Such a CFG like this could generate... Uh, Differences between plural and singular, which we would not want it to. Uh, uh, men's hit the ball. Right? Something like this. It could be generated. And a context-free grammar is called context-free because it's basically like Mad Libs. When you apply a uh, non-terminal, you don't get the choice of when it produces those sentences or not. So... Chomsky notes that you know, it would be useful to apply uh, certain sentences to certain contexts. Like we want to only describe something in a certain way. And that we only want to produce on that uh, non-terminal if uh, some other conditions are met. So he enumerates what's called a context-sensitive grammar. Which is like a context-free grammar, but it's a generalization. A regular grammar has rules that are like... Um, v goes to sigma v. Uh, a context-free grammar has rules that are like v goes to uh, v union sigma star, so any string of terminals or non-terminals. But a context-sensitive grammar has rules that go like u v w goes to uh, u v union sigma star uh, w. So you can, you can uh, it's basically set of conditionals on when to apply certain rules. If a string of terminals or non-terminals appears where you want it to in beforehand, then you can deduce it. So let me give you an example of a context. The only difference between a context-free grammar and a context-sensitive grammar is that the, the left-hand side of a production of a context-sensitive grammar has uh, additional symbols besides one non-terminal. Let me give you an example of a context-sensitive grammar. Consider... Uh, S goes to uh, A, S, B, C, or uh, epsilon. And then we have C, B goes to B, C. Let's say A, little a, capital B, goes to lowercase a, lowercase b. Lowercase b, capital B, goes to B, B. And C, capital C, goes to lowercase c, lowercase c. Something like that. I think that's all the rules I need. No, I need one more. Uh, lowercase b, capital C, goes to uh, lowercase b, lowercase c. Okay. Notice how the rules have on the right-hand side a selection of a string of terminals and non-terminals. You replace this substring of terminals and non-terminals with a substring of terminals and non-terminals, right? Um, what grammar does this language produce?
Yes, sir. Uh, a number of A's, a number of B's, a number of C's. I think they're different. I think they're the same. Unless I made a mistake. This produces a non-context-free langu language. The number of A's, A to the N, B to the N, C to the N. We'll prove later with an advanced pumping lemma that that does not have a context-free grammar. But this is what I claim is a context-sensitive grammar to decide this. Let's consider starting with S and can proceed with several productions. We're going to apply this rule several times and then apply this one. So what we're going to get is that S is going to go through a sequence of productions from to A to the N, uh, B, C to the N. As you apply this production, you're going to get a B, C, B, C, B, C, B, C, B, C, B, C, B, C. OK? Now I claim by this one production only, you should be allowed to swap Anytime you have B, next, B and C next to each other, you can swap them. Would you agree that this production is all that's necessary for this to be converted, after several productions, to a string that looks like A to the N, B to the N, C to the N? Instead of B, C, B, C, B, C, you can swap the C's and B's several times, and you'll get all the B's and then all the C's. Okay? Now, these productions only are what allow you to cast from the non-terminal to the terminal, but they'll only allow you to do that after you've finished swapping everything in order. Again, the production stop after you're out of non-terminals. Non so these will put all your A's are going to stay the same. But anytime you have a B, a capital B, it's going to go to a lowercase b. Anytime you have a capital C, it's going to go to a lowercase c. So this can only produce, then, a string that looks like this. Not the most formal proof, but perhaps you can believe me that that is a context-sensitive grammar for this. Chomsky then describes uh, not necessarily like a formal context-free grammar. He strengthens the phrase structure in a certain way to allow it to be context-sensitive. And by allowing it to be context-sensitive, he solves this plural singular uh, argument. Because instead of having noun phrase, uh, instead of having sentence goes to noun phrase, uh, plus verb phrase, he can do like noun phrase singular plus verb phrase singular gets parsed a certain way. And that would be different than noun phrase plural plus verb phrase plural gets to be parsed a certain way. By having multiple things on the left-hand side, he can do that. Now, uh, final remark, is English actually context sensitive or is it context free? Like the grammatically correct sentences in English? The answer is, I don't know, because I read a paper and it was like English is not context free. And another paper was like, actually, there was a bug in your paper. Something like this. So this is like kind of wildly debated upon, I suppose, still. Polish, I think, unambiguously is context sensitive. And I think most languages are context free. It's an interesting question to think about. Can you enumerate English only using a context free grammar? Maybe. Is context sensitivity useful? Also, maybe. But is it necessary? Interesting question. Don't know the answer. All right.